Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. Hello, and welcome once again to The Emmett Blackwell Show. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. On this episode, I'll be speaking with author Ernest Soler. He is a professor at Mount St. Mary's University in Maryland, and also has written three amazing books, one of which named Spirit of Sasquatch. We talk about his work with behavioral education, some of his real-life paranormal events that have inspired his writing, and how he approaches storytelling. So, without any further ado, let's begin. Spirit of Sasquatch by Ernest Solar. Trevor Blackwood lost his wife to the mythical creature known as Bigfoot and never came to terms with her disappearance. It's been over a decade since she vanished, but time hasn't stopped for Trevor and his sons, Darius and Brock, from searching for her and the creature responsible for her disappearance. In fact, their adamant hunting has given the Blackwood trio a reputation, one that's caught the attention of government forces with ulterior motives. After the youngest Blackwood goes missing, like his mother, the line between myth and reality is quickly blurred. Brock soon discovers the secrets that shroud the feared beast. Hunted by the government and sought by his father, the young boy discovers the truth behind his mother's disappearance at the hands of a menacing Sasquatch. The true nature of the Blackwood family legacy is revealed when the threads of Brock's life crashes together in a devastating confrontation with the government and the legendary creature known as Bigfoot. Get your copy of Spirit of Sasquatch on Amazon.com. All right, and I am here with the author, Ernest Solar. And Ernest, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Emmett. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. So, now you've written a couple of books. When did you actually begin writing? Um, I actually started writing uh, when I was really young. Mm-hmm. Um, I was I used to I used to read a lot of comic books when I was younger, and I would take the comic book stories and rewrite them as my own stories and change the characters. Um, pretending that I was actually the writer of the comic book. Oh, that's pretty Um, cool. Yeah, so growing up, um, I had a speech impediment, and I I had a difficult time talking and expressing myself. And what I found that my words actually gave a voice to what I was trying to say, I really kind of dived in to storytelling and writing stories and um, and I think reading comic books really helped kind of propel me in that direction. Yeah. And the visuals, too. I mean, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard that Stan Lee just passed away. And Yes, it's a very, it's a very sad day in the comic book world. Yeah, it is. It's, it's incredible how much he did, too. And just the story writing and everything, I mean, is incredible, the characters that he created. And so that kind of leads me to my next question. Uh, what types of books and movies did you actually, you know, read up on and, and watch when you were growing up? Uh, well, I was a huge Star Wars fan, mm. and um, I loved the movies. I remember my father taking me to see the first one. I remember my grandmother taking me to see Return of the Jedi. Um, so I was always a big Star Wars fan. I was always a big um, Raiders of the Lost Ark fan. Mm. Um, I read a lot of Ray Bradbury, Robert Heinlein, um, you know, a lot of the classic sci-fi. And then every every comic book that I could get my hands on, um, I had a, well, I still have a extensive comic book collection. And, um, you know, it's just, I just found that storytelling fascinating. And um, so, I mean, it, it, it um, 
I guess really stemmed from the comic books and then kind of wanted to sci-fi from there. Um, and then, you know, into the realm of movies. I didn't really watch too much TV as a kid, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know. <laughs> That's okay. I, I fully understand because it was like, you know, you can watch a TV show, you can get engrossed into it, and uh, then, you know, the TV show ends or the series ends and you're just horribly disappointed. That happens to well, me on Netflix. Well I, will, well, well, I think it was more because it was my parents that picked the TV shows. I didn't mm. really get to pick the TV shows. So, you know, I mean, I would sit and, like, watch with them, but it was never something... Uh, you know, I, I don't think it was until X Files that I was like, "Hey, oh, yeah. wait, <laughs> wait, wait a second, this is kind of cool." Oh, yeah. I loved X Files. That was like my favorite show growing up. It was one of those, yeah. and it was just like amazing that they had like it's almost like they picked a show for me, you know, because I loved. I always I liked uh, Unsolved Mysteries too, and so it was yeah. like when that show was running, and then. Shortly after that got going, X Files came up, and I was just like, "Oh yes, finally!" You know, something really cool. Yeah. It's like I wanted to be an FBI agent, but I knew that if I walked into the FBI saying I want to be the guy who runs the X Files, they'd probably just laugh me out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> so funny you should mention that. I actually did apply to the FBI because I wanted to be that agent. <laughs> so. But, yeah, I guess the universe had other plans for me because I didn't make it as an agent. Ah, uh, yeah. So. Well, hey, you know. Now, now you're a professor at Mount St. Mary's University in Maryland. Uh, what do you teach out there? Um, I teach um, special education courses mm. for our pre-service teachers. So it's um, I, I mostly teach like juniors and seniors and graduate students at these are the students that are um, going out into the field and they have um, a placement in a classroom and I teach them the basics of special education and how to manage students with different disabilities. That's that's extremely commendable, sir. Um, Thanks. You know, and it's something that, you know, you don't think about. You know, you think the teachers had to kind of come up with a with a way to do this themselves. And that's cool that you're coaching a lot of teachers on this and, and teaching them how to, to deal with these children. Because just like any other kid, you know, they have dreams, they have aspirations. Um, it's amazing what they can do, you know, and it's surprising that, that you're part of that. That's That's really cool. Thanks. Um, I, I actually spent 10 years in the classroom as a special ed teacher. Um, I worked with students with emotional disabilities. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they tend to be a little bit more difficult uh, because they have a chip on their shoulder, to mm-hmm. say the least. And um, I, can, I remember this one time, this one student walked into my classroom. I'd never met him before. He walks in, he looks at me, and he was like, I hate you. Wow. And, and I just, you know, I just looked at him. I was like, "You don't even know me." He's like, "You're a teacher. I have no reason to know you." You know, and I was like, oh, "I was like, all right, great." And um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it was it was different every single day. But uh, I honestly loved being in the classroom. I honestly loved working with those students. And and my philosophy, my thought behind it was. I, I honestly believe that at some point they're going to pull themselves together. Mm-hmm. And I wanted them to get a diploma so that it was one less hurdle that they would have to jump over once they did pull themselves together. And um, so I would I would fight tooth and nail to get them to, you know, get through high school, graduate. And then after they graduated, you know, it was up to them to, you know, find their path. And um, so, and then... One of my professors in my master's program was like, "Hey, you'd be a phenomenal professor." And I was like, "Oh, you're crazy." <laughs> next, next thing I knew, I was getting my PhD and and writing a dissertation and then getting a job as a professor and how I train teachers. So I I have absolutely nothing to complain about. I I, I love what I'm doing. Yeah, that's and you know, and this funny thing too, especially when you look around at like. Hollywood and anybody who's kind of in the arts, you know, you notice too that they have kind of a history. Some of them may have a history of, you know, learning disabilities or behavior dis- disabilities or, you know, they, they have that chip on their shoulder because they, they can't really 
work well with others or something like that. In, in any case, sure. it's it's almost amazing when you see somebody who might have had dyslexia and there's some famous right. actor or some famous writer and you're like, how in the world did you do that? Well, you know, they overcome their hurdles. You know, they, they, they strive for what they want and then they finally find what they want through the coaching and helping of, of teachers like you and, and people who are supportive of their creative side. And um, it's really amazing that, you know, you're doing what you're doing. It's it's really cool. Other than you know the the fact that you've written a few books here, and um, that kind of leads me to my next question. Now, uh, your book Spirit of Sasquatch is about the elusive Bigfoot. Now, what type of research did you have to do in preparation for this novel? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> you just have like twelve um, browsers open at the same time, and just <laughs> <laughs> no. So. Um... That's a really good question. Uh, a lot of reading. I've read a lot of different books about Bigfoot and about Sasquatch. Uh, but the important thing is is getting out into the field, getting mm-hmm. out into the in, into the forest, and actually looking and meeting the researchers. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, it, it, there's different types of thinking when it comes to Bigfoot and the type of creature that it is. So it's actually a lot, a lot more scientific and spiritual at the same time, mm-hmm. more so than what the TV shows lead you to believe. Um, you know, there's there, there's a, a group of researchers out there that believe that it is a gorilla, a, a, a North American gorilla or ape that hasn't been identified yet, and that it is purely a flesh and blood creature. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on the spiritual side, um, you start diving into the Native American lore and legends. And Native Americans believe that Sasquatch Bigfoot is a spirit creature that can take physical form. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you have these two different camps of researchers, and they kind of view it in different capacities in different ways. But, um, I mean, to really get into it, uh, you have to go out to the forest at night. You have mm-hmm. to, you know, you know, trudge those game trails and get muddy and get dirty. And and many of the scenes that I wrote, um, I would honestly pretend that I was a Bigfoot creature and just wander through the woods for a few hours mm-hmm. and, you know, try to, like, see the forest from their perspective. Yeah. And, um so, I mean, it, you know, it was the only way that I could get into character, per se, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would never follow trails. I would follow game trails or I would find, like, the thickest, you know, set of bushes and brambles there was. And I would go through it and see what was on the other side. Um, and and I would trudge around at night in the dark without a flashlight and, um Sometimes it ended up okay. Sometimes I got a little a little beat up, and sometimes <laughs> I got scared as hell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I can really, imagine. <laughs> you know, it just really depended. So. Wow, and and you know the the funny thing is, there's there's like different versions of them all over the world. You know, I mean, it, it just cannot be coincidence. I'm I'm a firm believer. Anybody who's out there listening, I'm a firm believer in <laughs> aliens, Bigfoot, ghosts, the whole shebang. Okay, and it's only because there's so many recorded incidents of certain things like that and it's it's right. unbelievable that we still haven't right. found it you know and you know it, it makes you think though what what if we did you know i mean the way that the whole country is divided and everything and and the way that we treat other people it, it almost makes you wonder if it's probably a good thing that the bigfoot stays hidden you know yeah yeah i mean i, mean, I, I kind of touch on that in my book a little bit um, you know, I, I wrote it in a way where if you knew nothing about the Bigfoot world or about Bigfoot, you could walk away with some new knowledge. That's yeah. probably me being a teacher, kind of infusing that in there. But but I didn't want to isolate veteran researchers. So no. I, tried to, I tried to write in a way where if you are a veteran researcher and you've been on the field, you would come across a story and be like, oh, yes, I've experienced that or I've seen that or I've heard that story before, you know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was trying to write it in that capacity. And then that's also why I pulled in the government cover-up aspect mm-hmm. of it. Um, there is a theory that the government does know about Bigfoot. 
um, and that they keep it covered up for different reasons, purposes, mostly because of money is mm. the biggest reason. But the belief is that if I came out of the forest and I had hardcore evidence, like a skull or a skeleton or something that would prove the existence, then I would be visited by two gentlemen. One is a man in black. Another one is a lumberjack. And they mm. tell you that's not what you found. That's not what you have, right? But otherwise, um, if you just run around the woods looking for a Bigfoot and screaming and doing wood knocks, they just let you go about your business because society will make fun of you and mm -hmm. no one's going to believe you. Yeah. Right. So, it, you know, it's it's um, the part that I liked most about the research was the Native American lore. And that mm -hmm. was that they only let themselves be seen as a gift or mm -hmm. as a warning that something's going to change in your life. And so, I, I, you know, I always found that fascinating um, because, it, you know, there was no evil intent. There was no, nothing negative wrapped around it. It was just, you know, they were there to protect you. They were there to let you know something was going to change. It was a gift to actually see them. And I always found that fascinating in all the stories that I read. So now in your book... Now, Trevor Blackwood, he's he's basically the main character of this. He, he loses his wife to a supposed Bigfoot attack or something along those lines. And Trevor and his son search for the for the Bigfoot. Um, this kind of piques the interest of, like you said, those government officials. So it kind of follows along the same line. How does the father and sons begin that search for, you know, the Bigfoot or, you know, his wife? Well, um, Trevor and his wife... Um, the way I wrote it or the backstory was that Trevor and his wife were already researchers, but they had two different views where mm. Trevor believed it was flesh and blood and his wife believed it was a spirit creature. Mm -hmm. And so um, to get her point of view, I put in the like journal sections of a journal that she wrote to kind of put her point of view into the story. Um, so, you know, they already kind of know how to do Bigfoot research, they've already been out into the fields. Um, on, I've been on many expeditions, and I've been on expeditions where whole families are there. The, mm. the, the, you know, the father, the mother, the two kids, and, you know, the kids are two, three years old, and they're riding around on the four-wheelers in the middle of the night looking for Bigfoot. So, you know, it, it wasn't too far of a stretch for me to create these characters because I've seen similar families like that already mm -hmm. and you know and i could see if 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 his spouse got killed or abducted how the other spouse could become a, obsessive with mm -hmm. you know now i really need to find out what's going on mm -hmm. yeah so it was much of a stretch yeah and with the kid ang angle you know i mean really every kid whenever you hear about bigfoot for the first time i remember hearing about harry and the hendersons and i watched the movie i was like man Mom, Dad, I really want a Bigfoot living in my house. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. it, it is a cool concept, you know, and it's just neat because you got this furry Chewbacca like thing uh, that hangs right. out in the woods and it still it leaves that mystery. Nowadays, we don't have many mysteries in the world. You know, everything is so connected, you know, everything is so sure. mechanicalized. And, you know, that kind of leads me to the next question, because you live. Um, near the mountains of Virginia, which is like the hot spot of Bigfoot activity. And, you know, people can contest this. You know, some people say it's California. Some people say it's, you know, Virginia. I'll tell you that most Bigfoot sightings, I think, are in Michigan, which is where I'm at <laughs> now. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, you know, it, it's crazy. Now, when you went out and did these things, when you went out and did the research for it and kind of got into character, did you experience anything yourself? Yes. Wow. Um, I... I have, I've found two prints, um, in two different locations at two different times. Um, I've had something scream at me, mm. um, that, that I'm pretty sure was not a human and was not an animal. And, um, I've, I believe that I had a sighting in North Carolina and I believe I had a sighting in Colorado. Wow, but the Colorado one, I'm I'm still kind of on the fence about that. Well, but, still, um, you think about it too. If if you're gonna take the spiritual side of this, 
I mean, you should be feeling great that you even experienced the things you experienced, you know, because it really does. I mean, if it is that gift of, you know, we, we will we let you see us when we want you to or, or when we feel comfortable around you, even just a call or a print or anything is just pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, so I had this belief of intent. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I, I practice mindfulness. Um, it's one of the things that helps me stay sane and patient in my busy life. But, um, you know, I, I practice this intent of, you know, if, if you put this intent out there of what you want to experience and if you pay attention and if you're curious, you'll be able to pick up on the the world providing the evidence of this intent. And mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm a firm believer that they feel your intent before you even step into the woods. And, and, I, and I feel that's the same with a dog or a cat or mm -hmm. even people if they're actually paying attention. But so, you know, as much as I want Harry and the Hendersons to <laughs> step out onto the trail and shake my hand, I don't think I would physically be able to handle it. Mm -hmm. But but I could handle finding a print. I could handle something screaming at me. I could handle the glimpse of a head going through the trees, right? So, you know, like those are things that I can right now wrap my my brain around. And, you know, so I, I really think it's this intent. Like I want to experience something, but, you know, I don't want to have a heart attack when I experience yeah, exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. Right? So, you know, so it's, it's you know, and, and if they are spiritual creatures that can take physical form, I believe that they can feel that. They can feel, you know, what, you know, if you're there to shoot them or if you're mm -hmm. there to take a picture of them or if you're there just to be curious, right? Like, I think that they could feel that. Um, but then at the same time, I mean, I think there's parts of the forest that we are disconnected from. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, you know, there's stories of how they glide through the forest or they melt into the trees. And, you know, I, I think... Um, as humans, we're disconnected from nature and we're disconnected from the forest. And so when, when we see something like that, you know, if, if we see a deer melt into the trees, we think it's magical, but it's not really magical. We've just lost that connection and mm -hmm. they still have that connection. So, you know, I mean, I, I think there's a lot more goes into the research than, than people give credit for. But again, like, I, I think you have to like live it and have your boots on the ground and, be there to experience those things. Yeah, it's actually kind of crazy because honestly, I think the same way, you know, just like when you when you approach an animal, like say, you know, we just went and got a cat not too long ago. Um, the, when you come into like a, a shelter or something like that, you can tell if you're somebody who's in tune with things, you can tell that sure. these animals are scared. They're, they're terrified. Most of the time they'll lash right. out. But then once they realize that, that you're not afraid. You know, they'll tell you that right. in dog training. They'll tell you that in cat, you know, I guess psychology, I guess there's some kind of thing like that now. Um, but they'll tell you that animals sense those feelings, you know, and it's crazy because even some animals who have sensed cancers and things like that, it's like right. obviously there's this intent. There's this there's this power sure. that we don't see. And even science is saying the same thing. The way that, you right. know, our electrons give off vibrations and, and things like that, it's like, yeah, I'm a firm believer in that stuff. So, you know. It's really cool that you're on the same page as I am on this. I thought I was the only one, but uh, well, yeah. it, it, you know, and um, and it applies to students as well. You mm -hmm. know, I've walked into classrooms where the students know that the teacher's afraid of them, and the students take advantage of that teacher. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I've walked into the classrooms where the teacher is not afraid of the students, and they have complete control of the classroom and the learning environment. To, you know, I mean, you know, it happens with animals. It happens with humans. I think it's just a matter of being in touch with that intent and, and, you know, being in touch with, you know, what you're experiencing and what you're feeling. So yeah, yeah it's definitely cool. Well, that's probably cool, why you're training all these teachers to know how to do what you do. So <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> so now you've also written another book called The Well House. And I was just looking just at the cover at this one. Okay. And that is an amazing cover. Very beautifully done. Um, now The Well House, tell us a little bit about that book. So the well house is based on true events or inspired by true events. And 
Um, and the neighborhood that we live in, there is an abandoned house that was built back in the 1800s. There's the house and the barn. And we live on, our community has 90 acres of like forest land. Mm-hmm. And when I was doing research for Spirit of Sasquatch, I was trying to get high tech and getting, so I got a recorder so that I could try to capture howls and wood knocks and things of that nature. So one night I went um, to the heart of the forest of our neighborhood and I put the recorder out just to see if I could capture any sounds. And I put the recorder out and it was probably probably about 500 yards away from this old abandoned house. And, and I went back the next day and I grabbed the recorder and I was going through the recordings and I was listening to it. And I estimated about two in the morning, I hear this little girl's voice say, ta-da. Oh, wow. And I, and I just, I like stopped and I was like, Christine, which is my wife. I was like, you got to listen to this. What do you hear? And sure enough, she was like, that's a little girl saying, ta-da. I was like, it's <laughs> two in the morning. There's no girls in the woods at two in the morning. Right now. I was like, what is it? And um, so, uh, so you know, it was just, it was fascinating. And then a couple of weeks passes by, and my neighbor tells me a story um, that a old farmhand was killed on the property, and um, they found a bike and I think a sledgehammer in the pond. Oh wow! And so then my creative juices started flowing, and I started to kind of piece that audio recording and the old story of the farm hand getting killed and I and I created this these characters sure enough would be my wife and I and um so they had this experience of of hearing this recording and experiencing strange phenomenal ghostish type things and I go back and forth from the past to the present telling this little girl's story and telling our story and then it all kind of comes together at the end but it's so it's kind of it's kind of like a it's a different type of ghost story because um but it's but it's really about this girl living on this farm and why she does cartwheels and says (laughs) ta-da you know know, so it, it um People that have read it tell me that the ending's really messed up, <laughs> <laughs> but um, which makes me laugh and smile because because it reminds me of Ray Bradbury, mm-hmm. and I was like, how like you know Ray Bradbury would have an ending. And they're like, well, I was not expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was like, oh, well, at least I did my. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's at least I did justice to him. So. That's got to be the funnest part about writing paranormal stuff that that's based on like a shred of reality, just because you get to fill in the blanks, you know, you get to fill in the holes and you get to make the story kind of your own, um, especially right. the Bigfoot story and with, you know, the well house, amazing ideas. I mean, in, in the fact that it gets those creative juices flowing, I mean, think about it. Had you not had that ta-da moment <laughs> from that right. little girl, then you probably might have not actually produced this book. And it, it's really cool. Right. Yeah, and you know, I mean, it, it's just. I think what was fun about the Well House w- was that I linked this little girl to the death of this farmhand, and 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 I linked the bicycle, and I and so I kind of linked it all together. But then when you read it, it you kind of step away, thinking like, wait, that could have actually really happened. And I think that's what was so fun about it was that, you know, like, I, it was like I was creating a reality that actually happened, and, I, mm. and that's what I really enjoyed about it. Yeah, so then your next book could be about channeling somebody, because you're kind of doing that right now, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, that would be a great idea. But um, now your your stories, they all kind of have these amazing visuals, okay? They they mostly come from, like, specific places in your life, uh, Maryland and Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania, stuff like that. Now, when you're walking through the woods, do you get inspiration from, like, nature and things like that, too? Yeah. Anytime I'm in the woods, um, I'm inspired by something. Um, mm-hmm. I, I love I, I love hiking. I love being in the woods. But, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be in nature. Um, I can take a thread or a kernel of an idea and give me enough time and I can develop it into something and run with it. Mm -hmm. Um, For example, um, speaking about cats, uh, (laughs) a couple of years ago, we, we adopted two cats at the same time. And one was a year old and one was like six weeks old. And I have never had cats my whole entire life. So I knew nothing about cats. Oh, it's a whole other world. (laughs) (laughs) Right. 
And I woke up um, in the middle of the night, like the first night, and I heard the cat obsessively licking himself. And I only thing I remember was that he was sitting on her dirty clothes, and I thought I saw a human caddish person sitting on her clothes licking himself. <laughs> and so, which of course freaked me out. And um, so then uh, from that, I actually wrote a short story about our cats were actually um, assassins and that mm. they could take human form and um, that we accidentally adopted them and we weren't supposed to. And we were supposed to give them back. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's um, what every cat, yeah. I think, is really aspires to be. Yeah. <laughs> right. I think so, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. I mean, just give me, like, one strange thing and give me enough time to let it, like, kind of sit in my brain. And I, I could probably come up with something silly for a kind of story about it. So. <laughs> Now, um, when it comes to like your other book, and I was kind of looking at this one very closely because you're in tune with things. Okay. You, you're, you're, you're see the nature and the flow and the things behind the curtain is basically the only way I can describe it. You kind of wrote this surreal science fiction, um, and it's called, um, two moons rising. Okay. And you explore that place between being awake and dreaming, which is something that, I mean, for any author out there or any reader out there, I'll tell you, if you get an, a chance to read this book, check it out. Okay. It's something that, that will take you out of your comfort zone of what your reality is and put you in different places. And you've done an excellent job on that. Now, where did this book come from? Where did it get inspired from? Uh, actually, a dream. Hmm. Actually, um it was actually a dream when I was in high school. Um, I had a, I had a dream that I was in the middle of an ocean on a boardwalk because you know you can do anything in dreams. Oh yeah. And and I was walking with an older gentleman, and some people were smiling at me, some people were crying, some people were ignoring me, and he you know explained the difference between the three different types of people. And then I remember seeing these like dolphins and whales in the ocean that were not necessarily silver, but they had a silver-ish tint to them. And I woke up and I and I wrote it down, and then over the years, just kind of just kind of meld and meshed into my head, and and then I started, you know, that what if question, like what if Earth had two moons? Mm -hmm. What if aliens were living on that other moon? What if the aliens could suppress the image of the moon from our subconsciousness? Mm. And so it just kind of, you know, like everything just kind of started to kind of mesh and meld together. And, and um, I, I wrote it in like four different threads because mm -hmm. I, I believe that we have, I mean, the only term I can think of is soul threads. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have, you know, like our, our soul is tethered to our physical body, but it's, but this thread is like drifting into the, nether regions of the universe or, you know, and like we can't see them, but the aliens could see them. And mm -hmm. so then the aliens could attach themselves to our soul thread and basically, you know, take us over. And, um, and so that through this, they were suppressing our, the images in our mind of the, you know, subconsciousness. And then, and then I started to like, you know, what if someone had narcolepsy and when he dreamed, he actually went, you know, was able to see the aliens, was able to see all this happening. And then, you know, when you have a alien invasion, you have to have somebody save the world. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. You know, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it was just kind of, I mean, it, like, it probably took me, honestly, like four or five years to write that story, where Spirit Sasquatch took me six months. Um, you know, I mean, I, I uh, there was a I can't say I did a lot of research per se for Two Moons Rising. It was just it was just information that I was always fascinated about and always read about, and I just kind of took that mantra of write what you know and just kind of ran with it and went with it and yeah, enjoyed and, it. And you know, and that's the thing too is it's like it's not it's not a very out there idea. I mean, I, I believe it was Descartes who said that maybe we're all living in a dream and our dreams are reality, and it really right. does kind of make you think. And the fact that you ask all these what if questions that's what makes great sci fi. That's what makes great stories because you're asking what if. And and I have to tell you one thing here. 
I wish I would have met you back when this show started, because <laughs> honestly, that's what this whole Emmett Blackwell show was going to be, was talking about paranormal events. So it's it's like a, a breath of fresh air when I get to talk about these things, <laughs> um, because it is cool, you know, and there's so many theories right. out there. And really, when you have a shred of truth, you can build on it. And um, a lot of people oh, have done that, you know. Um, so now I have a question for you because you are an author and even though your stuff is fiction, um, you've been writing for a while now. Now, what advice would you give a brand new author? Write every single day. I, you know, I, I try to write a thousand words a day. Mm. Um, sometimes I get to 800, sometimes I get to 3000. It really depends. <laughs> and it, you know, and to me, it, it doesn't matter what, the writing is um, because you know being a professor I have to do academic writing as well so Mm -hmm. um, you know so if if it's if it's writing a proposal for a research study or if it's writing a short story or if it's writing my next book or if it's writing in a journal for my son you know it it, to me it it doesn't it doesn't matter what the writing is just just write just put your thoughts on paper you, you know the more you practice, the more you do it, the the more you're able to learn how to manipulate the words and how to create images and pictures with your words and create characters with your words. And, you know, if, if you, know, if you think, like, I'm just going to write, you know, every other day or once a week, sure, that works. But, I mean, it, it's just, you know, it's just practice. Mm-hmm. When you practice, that's what makes you stronger. And, you know, don't worry about the spelling. Don't worry about the grammar. Don't worry about the sentence structure. That's why you have editors, right? Mm-hmm. Like, find a great editor that 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 hears your voice and, you know, latch on to them and work with them. Um, but the most important thing is just, is just write. Just, mm-hmm. like, physically sit down at the keyboard or the journal and just get those thoughts out and you'll be amazed at the ideas that flow from those thoughts. Yeah. It's it's kind of funny too, because like when a fresh idea just kind of pops into your head, not all of it happens in a grammatical linear style. You might have thousands of ideas hitting you all at one time. And it's just like a flash of this, you know, wow, Hey, I got to write this down. And you're just scrambling to put something down that makes any sense, especially with things like dreams. And I've heard that from people too, is that if they keep a dream journal, they, they do a lot better as far as getting their writing started. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like a story starter. And then they start to recognize that they're having more and more dreams. And this goes back to that whole intent thing that you were talking about. It, It does, it does help. You know, if you were to say, hey, I'm going to sit and write a dream journal every night for the next month, chances are you're going to have a few more dreams because you're going to start noticing more, you know? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, 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 and never throw away anything that you write, right? Like, I mean, you know, I mean, to me, whatever you write is your voice. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's coming from your soul. That's who you are. And don't, don't delete it. Don't throw it away. Um, it might not fit for that story. It might not fit for whatever you're writing. Um, but maybe it will in two weeks. Maybe it will in six months. Maybe it'll be a kernel of an idea two years from now. You know, um, I always have a journal. And when I finish a journal, I go back through and I reread it to refresh myself with like, oh, yeah, there was that idea. Oh, yeah, there was that idea. Um, and I'll, I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, I had in one of my journals from a couple of years ago, I had an idea of um, a teenage boy with emotional disability and a teenage boy with autism became friends in a neighborhood. And so I, I really wanted to do something with that, but I didn't know where to go with it. And just recently, probably about three months ago, we were walking through the neighborhood and there's this huge oak tree that literally is split down the middle and it looks like something crawled its way out of the trunk oh, wow. of this tree. And I, you know, and I showed my wife and I was like, wow, I was like, a giant must have came out of that. You know? <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, you know, we go about our business and then I was up looking at my bookshelf and I was looking at some books and there was a dragon book and I was like, hey, wait what if a dragon came out of that? Mm. What if the boy, those two boys found that dragon, right? And so then it's just like, 
you know, these ideas start to percolate and form. So it's like, you know, don't ever throw away anything that you write. Um, cause it, it, you know, it's your voice. It's who you are. You know, you're expressing that to the universe and who knows how it's going to come true. You know, and that's, you know, you kind of touched on something that, <laughs> I mean, it's extremely symbolic of how you have lived your entire life. And that is don't throw ideas away. Don't throw good things away. And you look at your entire life. You look at what you do for a living, how you write, how you bring up ideas. And I am reminded of the fact that just because somebody might have a, a disability or an emotional you know, chip on their shoulder or a, a mental disorder, don't throw those people away because you never know what they can accomplish. You know, you never know exactly. if that, that person is going to be something amazing. Even if it isn't amazing to everybody, it's amazing when they do it. You know what I'm saying? It's amazing sure. that they can achieve something like that. And I just want to say thank you for, for doing what you do. I mean, just the fact that you even came on the show and I was able to talk about paranormal stuff. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, you, you really um, are an amazing person, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Now, I do have one more question. I, I hope that you can answer this one. Um, would you mind playing a game with me? I will try my hardest. <laughs> okay. Why does everybody have to say that? Like <laughs> some hard game. Okay. You really can't lose. Okay. But <laughs> okay. So here it is. It's the word association game. And we just tried this uh, just recently. And um, because the word association game is just such a boring title, I'm going to give it the, the world word mega super ultra association game. Um, and that's because this thing is worth, get this, two trillion points. Now, you can't use these points for anything. You can't exchange okay. them for money. And um, while well, they're just going to clutter up your room, and we know that you don't throw away anything. So chances are you're going to have a whole bunch of points and a whole bunch of papers all in the same place. Um, but here's how it works. Each player will choose 10 words. Okay. You must associate each word with another word, excluding any word that starts with a particular letter. Are you ready? Uh, sure. All right. Here we go. I exclude anything with the letter F. Okay, here we go. My first word is bobble. Bobble. Shake. Okay. Story. Tail. Okay. Big. Jumbo. Run. Sprint. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a really good one. Uh, stage. Theater. Oh, good one. Good one. Uh, light. Uh, can't say that one. Um... I can't say that either. <laughs> Light. Um, illuminate. Okay. Uh, hyper. Spaz. Space. Vast. Yellow. Bright. <laughs> and the very last one, fly. Now, why do you get to use F, but I can't? <laughs> um. <laughs> Insect. Okay, good. Uh, you got all the points on that one. You just won two trillion points. Um, now, go ahead and you can quiz me. And what's the letter you're excluding? The letter I'm excluding is T. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Forest. Ooh, you almost had me. <laughs> um, <laughs> leaves. <laughs> Okay. Uh, lake. Water. Bear. Furry. Mountain. Top. Oh. Mm. <laughs> okay. Go to the next one. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Flame. Fire. Ice. Vanilla. <laughs> Vanilla. <Yeah. laughs> um, road. Street. I was like, wait, did I say S? Did I said T. <laughs> You tripped me up. <laughs> School. 
High. <laughs> I don't know why I picked that one. <laughs> uh, high school. High school. That's why I met folks. That's what I meant. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I got you. I got you. Uh, wife. Hot. <laughs> <laughs> and last one. Education. Um, Books. Okay. Okay. So, so congratulations! You won our Ultra Mega Word World uh, Association game. Uh, you just received two trillion points that you can use nowhere. <laughs> but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I know it's pretty awesome, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> it is awesome. But now, where can people it, find your books? Uh, 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 Amazon dot com, uh, Barnes and Noble. Um, I think the Well House is only on Amazon, but Spear Sasquatch is on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Books a Million. Um, unfortunately, right now, Two Moons Rising is out of print, but mm-hmm. I'm working on bringing that back um, into publication. But when you're an indie author, it can it takes a little bit of time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. And I want to thank you so much for being here on the show. It was a blast. I mean, honestly, I didn't get to talk about paranormal stuff for almost like, what, two, three months? And I was kind of like having like, you know, those little shakes um, because <laughs> I was missing it. And um, it's really cool to have somebody on the show like you because you write paranormal fiction. And at the same time, you've gone through the walk, you know. I mean, it's awesome. So thank you so much for being here on the show. It was cool. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right, folks. And check out Ernest Solar on Amazon.com. And this is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. 